Well, Dad, I'm glad you're here with me on God Quest today. And uh, we're going to have a great discussion. I think it's going to be very interesting. I'm personally looking forward to it. I've been looking forward to it all week, knowing we were going to do it. And it's kind of kind of swinging the other way. Last week, our last episode, we talked about Gen Z and all of the opportunities this young generation uh, has yes. at their disposal. And I know you watch that anytime your uh, your grandson's on. I'm sure you're paying attention. <laughs> So, uh, but we're going to swing the other way and I want to go back some generations and I want to go to your generation, but I don't want to just go to your generation. I want, I want to go back to the generation before you, I see of men that impacted you, uh, your generation represents for us. Uh, they were the heroes that oftentimes when I was a young man, a teenager coming up in the ministry, uh, your generation were the elders that we were looking to, uh, some of the men like Marvin Trees, uh, a little older, obviously was brother G A Mangan and that generation of men, your generation, uh, who are some of the men that were your peers that maybe Gen Z doesn't know a lot about? I'm, I'm thinking of, of one R E Johnson. Yes. That was, I remember as a kid, he would preach for us a lot. So t- tell, uh, the audience a little bit about R E Johnson. Well, Actually, Brother Johnson was a confidant uh, of mine. He came out of the same church that my dad uh, came out of, Brother Robert LaFleur's in Oakdale, California, uh, oh, Louisiana. Louisiana. Oakdale, yeah. And uh, uh, There is an Oakdale, California. <laughs> yes, I got mixed up on that. Uh, but uh, because Brother uh, uh, Johnson, Johnson was... Uh, so close to my dad, that brought him close to me. Okay. And uh, I preached for him. And then after, after I became a pastor, he preached many times for us. I remember. And he was a confidant. Yeah. I could go to Brother uh, Johnson and ask him a question. If I was uh, uh, dealing with something, he he helped me. He talked to me. He helped me so many, much, and he was a great man. He was a he was a revivalist preacher. Yes. I remember there was an energy and excitement. That's right. Uh, he was uh, he was a powerful preacher. I remember him coming through. I recently came across uh, uh, online. I don't even remember where it was. Someone had messages of him, audio files on the internet, and so uh, it was it was a like a breath of fresh air. I had not heard his voice in so long. He pastored in Georgia. Yes, for a yeah. while. Yeah. But he pastored also in Louisiana. Okay. I, I don't remember that. I just remember when he was in Georgia when I was a, a younger man. Uh, then <clears throat> there were men like Marvin Treese, a, a scholar yes. among scholars. Yes. You were very close to, to yes. Dr. Treese. Yes. Brother Treese was a, a close friend. And uh, uh, I would say that he impacted me more than anyone during the years that I pastored in Baton Rouge. Which is interesting because he was a peer. Yes. And as a as a peer, did did you have the respect for him? Did did you did you guys recognize the greatness of Marvin Treese while he was alive? Sometimes it's we can, we can overlook the greatness in our friends. Uh, oh yes, brother brother Treese was well respected. He was. Even by he, his peers. That's right. He came once a year for, I, I don't even remember how many years he did this. He came and preached a prophecy conference at our church. And uh, that's where I learned a lot of of uh, things about prophecy. Was was those, I, I've heard you say that many times uh, in, in telling stories about the influence of Brother Treese upon your theology and eschatology. Was that happening while while he was preaching for you, or was that happening in discussions, relationship? How how did that happen? Both, both. Uh, I would go to his house uh, and uh, and talk to him, and he even came to Baton Rouge and uh, talked with me. Spent a lot of time together. Brother Trace was a really good friend and uh, loyal. Brother Treese, along with uh, a number of other men, I, I'm remembering as a as a young man growing up, there was what was called the Pure Gold Conference. Yes, 
uh, there were there were a number of you, Brother Trees, Brother uh, Fred Foster, yourself, uh, Brother Allen, Galen yeah, Allen, yeah, who yes, was in Westlake yes. at that time. I, I remember that conference and Brother Trees. Uh, I remember those those meetings. Some were in Baton Rouge, some were in Lake Charles, and the impact uh, that they had on me as a young man, uh, hearing uh, Brother Trees and. I remember <clears throat> Brother Treese would come. That was that was before technology, and he would he would have the yeah. he'd have the big handmade uh, charts, yeah. and uh, and then his son Brother Rick Treese would come, and maybe a couple other guys, and they would be kind of his assistants. And I remember hearing and watching, just amazed. Yes, but I'll I'll tell you what was what was fun to me was after church. Uh, that was in the days when preachers went. To the house, you know, yeah, oftentimes, yeah. you know, there wasn't as many restaurant o- options. And I remember just sitting around. I didn't even know half of what y'all were talking about. But I remember those discussions around the dinner table late into the night. Uh, how much of those kind of encounters shaped your ministry? Absolutely. It was, uh, it was, it, it impacted me so much. Brother Therese was not only a great preacher. He was a, he was a man. And uh, he was a friend. We didn't always talk about scripture and and prophecy, uh, but he he was very very uh, outspoken and uh, was kind and uh, taught me a lot of things. It was a it was a brilliant mind. I I remember one of the last times I ever saw him alive. I had preached for his son, brother Rick Trees, and after church, the three of us went to yeah. a restaurant, and I remember him just sitting there and I was trying to, he was up in years and I could tell he was in, he had had a lot of back issues and surgeries and, and uh, those are memories I cherish. You, you have a unique uh, thing of, of ministry in that your dad was uh, a pastor, a church planter, as well as a missionary, Greece, India, Philippines, Australia, maybe somewhere else. I can't even keep up with Paul Paul. Uh, and uh, the Fields Church. How many stories did I hear of Fields, Louisiana? You telling? T- tell a little bit about what happened with your dad taking this little handful of people in this little country place called Fields. Unpack that for me. Well, actually, my dad had been pastoring in West Texas, and he felt like going back to Louisiana. So we moved to Louisiana, and for a little while we lived with uh, one of my dad's uncles. And then two churches came uh, open. One was a church that was self-supporting for a pastor, and the other church was uh, had uh, it was an older church, one of the oldest churches in the state of Louisiana, uh, but it was very small. Uh, it had three adult people and uh, no children in the church. So the church had three. Three People. adults, and that's that's all it was to the church. That was at Fields. I guess and, it was wide open. <laughs> and uh, Dad said, God wanted me to go to Fields. And uh, it proved to be true because uh, it was not but a couple of years, maybe even not as long as that, that uh, he was running 150 to 200 people and we had to move out of the building and go outside and and uh, string up uh, uh, electrical lines outside for the people to to take care of the crowd. The whole community came out, and we had a great revival in fields. Uh, I think our our highest attendance was maybe two hundred and forty four or somewhere along that line. Wow. And, uh, that would have been in the late 40s, early 50s? Uh, the early 50s. Early 50s. So that would that would have been one of the larger churches, 240 people, I would think, in, in that time. Well, it, we didn't actually run 240 people, but that was a, a high attendance on a Sunday uh, one particular time. Wow. I have in my office, I have a... I have a picture that was given to me by the family of that revival and that that little church. 
there was no there was no way that that crowd could even get in the building That's that right. is is there and those lights that had been strung to those those uh, pine trees around the church. What an incredible uh, heritage there that I have that I value deeply in the ministry of your mom and dad, not only in the United States, but around the world. And a lot of uh, incredible stories that we could go into. Uh, another very unique thing is one of the one of the heroes of of your generation and my generation we look that y'all would look to was the great J.T. Pugh. That's right. One one of the one of the greatest men of God. I I'm so thankful looking back that I had the privilege of of spending personal time with him as well as hearing him. But you have the uniqueness. There was a connection with your call to preach with him and then your ministry later on. So so tell us about what's the co- connection you had with JT Pugh. Well, uh, my first encounter with him was uh, when I was very young. He preached a youth camp in Louisiana. And uh, I went to that youth camp, and uh, one particular night, his subject was the master's minority. And uh, before he preached, he had he distrib- had the ushers to distribute to all of the campers a little form to fill out. And when he preached his sermon, then he invited all of the kids to go down to the altar and fill that little uh, form out. And... Uh, fold that and put it in their Bible. And oh, was it like a commitment of what you were going to do? That's right. And it was while I was filling that out uh, around the altar, I felt like God was calling me to preach. Wow. Now, there had been people in Dad's church that said, Curtis, you're going to be a preacher. But I, I resisted <laughs> it. I didn't, I didn't feel anything. But that night... Uh, I, I really felt the call to preach. And to this day, I still have that little form somewhere. In, uh, and and here you are, 84 years old, and you still remember the name of the sermon. So it was an impacting oh, yes, moment. Yes. Now, J.T. Pugh, that wasn't the end of the story with you and J.T. Pugh. There was a meeting. Uh, you were somewhere, and there's something else that happened with J.T. Pugh. Talk about that. Well, I was I was preaching a revival in Cleveland, Texas, for Brother McNeely. Okay. And uh, I was in his office uh, one Saturday, and I was preparing for Sunday, and uh, there came a knock on the door, and I looked out the window, and it was Brother J.T. Pugh, and I was shocked because I had no personal connection with him that time. And so he said, uh, Brother Young, when I opened the door, he said, Brother Young, I want to I want to come in and talk with you. I said, OK. So he came in and he said he had just spent some time with Brother Kilgore. And he said, I need an assistant. And uh, Brother Kilgore recommended me to come and and talk to you and ask you, would you be willing? And I, without praying about it. <laughs> I just simply said, absolutely. <laughs> well, my Lord, is J.T. Pugh. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was engaged to be married at that point. And uh, uh, I, I, he, I, he said, uh, it was close to Christmas time. And uh, he said, now, I want you to get there before Christmas because my, my family and I are going on a Christmas vacation and I want you to take care of the church while I'm gone. Is this the famous watch night service? Yes. Okay. Uh, tell this. Let, let's break in the let's break in the spiritual story. This is a very funny story to me. Uh, I can't even imagine this happening. Was it, was it the New Year's Eve yes, service? Uh, they were gone through through Christmas till till after the uh, New, New Year. Year's Day, and uh, so Brother uh, Pew had said to me, he said. Uh, uh, there's a watch night that the goat takes place. Said we start at eight o'clock and we end at five minutes after midnight. So you got to produce a. a and he said, uh, he four said, hour uh, service. You can have testimonies, you can have special songs, but he said, and you can preach, but he said, go on until five minutes after twelve. No, wait, wait. Had you not been there before? No, I hadn't. This is your first assignment. Yes. 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 So uh, uh, sure enough, uh, 
New Year's Eve, uh, we started at 830, and uh, I had people to sing. I had testimonies. I preached a sermon, but and we prayed, but the prayer was getting very, uh, very small. And so finally, I said to the people, I said, we're going to do a little different uh, thing right now. It's your first said, assignment. We're going to dismiss you right now, and I want you to go home, and I want you to pray in your house until five minutes after midnight. So this is the church's introduction to you, your introduction to the church. J.T. Pugh leaves you. He was quite the prankster. Yes. I've heard you tell stories of going on hospital visitation and and he opened the door and direct you in and then closed the door behind you and yeah. you were in the janitor's closet at the hospital. Yeah. He, he was he was quite a character. Yeah. And uh, I will never forget I was I was riding in the car with you and him uh one time I was a young man and he he turned very seriously and here's the great JT Pugh. And uh I was you know, enamored, just sitting in the back seat, just hanging on every word that you and he were speaking about. And he turned to me and he said, Brother Miles, don't ever let them cut your head off. And it was so shocking. I said, okay. He said, two reasons. I said, okay. He said, number one, you'll be much shorter. And number two, you'll have nowhere to put your hat. And they turned back around. <laughs> That's just like Brother Few. And so I, I'm forever caught between this, the great icon of faith uh, ministry, J.T. Pugh, and the prankster that just knew how to make you laugh. These are these are memories that I cherish, and, and you've got memories uh, with him. You mentioned you were engaged to be married. You, you were engaged to mom, who was at a church in Houston, uh, she was the choir director, and her best friend was the organ player. And you and Uncle Simeon showed up somehow or another, and y'all wound up falling in love with the choir director and the piano player. And uh, Brother Foss's church, and you married, took the choir director and the piano player out. And Brother Foss told us this, this was the most expensive revival he <laughs> ever had. So talk about Orlin Ray Foss. He was a preacher of preachers. Yes. Yes. So he was he was mom's pastor. T tell about the relationship you had with him. He's a name that that maybe he maybe hasn't been as well known to a younger generation. But in my life, I remember I remember him preaching at Louisiana camp meeting and other other conferences and revivals. Dad, he he could preach hell so hot you could feel your feet were on fire. Yes, Brother Foss was a conviction preacher. Uh I remember one time when I was pastoring in North Carolina, I was the youth president of the district, and uh, Brother Foss came to preach our youth camp. And uh, uh, every night, uh, the, the altar would fill up before he gave the altar call. So one night, he told the congregation before he started preaching, he said, I don't want anybody coming to the altar until I give you the sign and tell you you to come to the altar. And he preached a message on hell. And I want to tell you that whole place, adults and campers, everybody in that youth camp was weeping. And uh, when he said, come to the altar, they rushed to the altar. And it just filled that whole place with uh, uh, the conviction that had come on them. Mm. Brother Foss was one of the greatest preachers I ever heard. I had the I had the privilege of hearing him many times, obviously because of the the family connection there and stayed in their home. But one of my one of my prized possessions uh, that you gave me a number of years ago, you went back for an anniversary service, Brother David Foss, the yeah. pastor there now and district superintendent uh, in Texas there, and you brought back a gift from the church of messages by Orlin Ray Foss at his home church. Dad, I have listened to those messages and I have thought to myself, it's unbelievable that a man could bring week after week after week that depth. Uh, and, and I try, I study, I pray, I, I try to get the mind of God. But there was, there was something very, very unique 
and yes. powerful about yes. the ministry of Orton Ray Foss. Yes. What what a and again you mentioned one of them being a man's man, Brother Trees. Orton Ray Foss was a was a man's man. Yes. And uh I, I I enjoy thinking of of so many of the memories that I share because of being in your home and the connection there. You you also had a friend that came to our home, preached in our pulpit that is highly revered even by a younger generation, Brother T. W. Barnes. Yes. Um uh you know, sometimes we, we look back with memories, but if you go revisit a message of some of these men, men that we forget how good of preachers they were. I was listening to Brother N. A. Ershin the other day and I was just driving down the road and I'm thinking, man, I had forgotten how powerful a preacher he was. And the same was true of Brother Barnes. It, it, there's a there's a lot of material out there you can you can listen to and watch. And I remember uh, one particular night he came uh, to preach in Baton Rouge on a Sunday night. You and I had been to the hospital to visit someone. That was before cell phones. We got home and mom had said, hey, Brother Barnes called. He's going to be in town tonight. And I knew you'd want him to preach. So he said, I, I told him you'd want him to preach. He said, sure. Well, we got to church that night and uh, Brother Barnes wasn't there. But you announced, folks, Brother Barnes is going to be coming in. And uh, he's going to be preaching. Everybody clapped, you know. And then, and then I was leading the choir. We got to the choir, and and Brother Barnes still wasn't there. And you motioned, sing another one. And so that was kind of the days we didn't have these big long rehearsals. We just kind of went to another song, and I and I I kept doing the chorus again. But Brother Barnes still wasn't there. And then finally, uh, I ended the choir song, and there was another brother Simpkins was there who was a presbyter visiting family in the church. And he was there and you turned to him. And I, I'll never forget brother Simpkins took the pulpit and you, you, as he took it, you had said, now folks, brother Barnes, I never really talked to him because I was at the hospital when he called earlier and I thought he was going to be here, but something has come up, but brother Simpkins here, he's going to preach it. Brother Simpkins took the pulpit and as he was about to read his text, Brother Barnes walked in. And I, I, it never ceases to amaze me when I relive this story is that God had worked all of that around so that the church knew that you had never had one conversation with Brother Barnes. And when Brother Barnes stepped and preached that night, I, I remember he preached uh, footprints in the sands of time. That's right. And he began to walk the floor. And there was a situation that was going on in the church. And I remember it well. And I remember the people involved. I was just I was just a young man and uh, finding my way. And I remember he walked off the platform down the right side of that that church, the Victorious Church on Victoria Drive. And, and he walked down that side. And as he was preaching, he pointed right at the he never called the man's name, but he caught he pointed his finger right at the man and he dealt with the issue. And that man repented and made everything right. And I have relived that moment so many times knowing that there was no way that any other thing except the perfect will of God happened in that service as Brother T.W. Barnes. And, and th these were men that you rub shoulders with almost on a daily and weekly basis. Brother Barnes was really a man of God. I had the opportunity of preaching two revivals for him. One when uh, I was very young, and then after I left Baton Rouge, I, uh, he wanted me to come to his church, and I, I preached another revival. He was a, a, an amazing man. And the night you were speaking about, uh, I really believe God uh, orchestrated that exactly like it happened so the church would know that I had not yeah. told Brother Barnes anything. Yeah, it, it was it was a moment that I will never forget. It was so poignant and it was so supernatural that yes. you, you could have heard a pin drop. It was like because that that issue was was had moved through the congregation. Yes. I, I remember it well. Uh, you were also friends with another great man of God. And we'll just kind of wrap up with this and we'll come back and talk about some more people another another time. But Brother Verbal Bean, one of the great men of God that that we revere in our memory and and I never had the chance to uh, hear him personally, but you've got some connections that go way back even to his early ministry. Am I correct? That's right. Uh, Brother Bain lived in a community about 15 to 20 miles from where Dad was pastoring. Okay. And 
Dad was pastoring at Fields at that time. And uh, Brother uh, Bean's grandfather came to our church, and his daughter uh, and uh, Brother Bean's sister was in a member of our church. And she was Sunday school teacher in uh, one of the classes that I was in okay. at Sunday school. And that's how I came to know Brother Verbal Bean. We saw him quite often. And incidentally, he preached his very first revival for Dad at Fields. <laughs> and uh, so... So there's uh, a lot going on in Fields. Yes. So uh, who would have ever thought that from these humble places, uh, you know, looking back, J.T. Pugh raised in poverty. Uh, Brother Falls pastored in Shady Grove. Shady Grove's still not a very big, it's just a spot in the road outside of Gina. Uh, you've got Brother Ari e. Johnson and Brother Barnes from Menden. Th these are not big metropolises with big cathedrals and, and seminaries. These were humble places that were often maybe even rural but God's hand reached down and anointed these men. And coming out, you look at some of the places like Oakdale and De Quincey and De Ritter, uh, Louisiana, uh, out of that Elton, Louisiana revival that sprung out of Arroyo Seco right. as the Jesus name. The power that came out of that Louisiana, East Texas conglomerate of apostolic churches that are still there. People, people today see all the, the churches, but they don't they don't really even understand the power of what was developing way, way back in, in those days. Dad, I really appreciate you uh, coming on today, and, and maybe this has shed some light and maybe told a new generation. Last week we talked about Gen Z, but now we're looking back at, at an incredible generation of ministry, and I, I count a high privilege to be able to share these stories. And there may be somebody watching that, this is going to spur them to go watch or listen to. I mean, let me just tell you, these men were powerful. Yes. And if we can just scratch the surface of what these great men and others did, uh, what a testimony. And Dad, you've impacted so many people. You've impacted me. And, and I have the privilege of working alongside of you. Here it is, 2024, to be able to go that far back to men like J.T. Pugh and Verbal Bean and Orlin Ray Foss that that connection is there. And uh, it's a it's a generational thing that I want to get all the way to Gen Z because if they get a little touch of that, they can impact their world. And and I look at this uh, generation that's uh, with us right now, mm -hmm. and I'm amazed at, at how great they are doing. And I thank God for them. Well, I think that about says it all right there. Yeah. Let's do this. Okay.